welcome. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshana b'mitzvotah v'tzivano l'asok b'divrei Torah. Amen. Thank you, Harlan. Thank you. So we are, of course, on that last Torah portion of Exodus, Shemot, and Parsha is Pekude. And hopefully you can see the text at this point. So we were involved in the begin. and we were discussing the priestly garments. This is the actual fabrication of the tabernacle. Uh, as you're becoming aware, uh, the last sections of Exodus uh, from uh, two portions following the second portion following the giving of the Ten Commandments all has to do essentially with the construction of the tabernacle and its importance and at the its prominence. I mean, there are uh, five parshiot that all deal with the construction of the tabernacle and of course the idea this yearning to become, bring the divine presence into this world. And these days with what's going on, boy, that would be pretty amazing if that were ever to happen. So we are talking about the garments of the high priest, and we're talking here about Vayasu et hakaton hakot not sheish. So they made the tunics of linen, Maase oreg, they were knitted, uh, knit, in knitted work, Aharon uh, Levanav, for Aaron and his sons. So there were times, of course, that we were just talking about the clothing of the high priest. He had a very, very special uniform. And uh, here we're talking about his sons as well, that both Aaron and the high priest and the other priests all wore these tunics. And I'm going to show these to you. So here's one way of looking at it. This is there. This is what we're talking about here. So there we are. So you can see this is what the regular priest wore. And this is what the high priest wore underneath. So you could see the white showing. This is the cloak that the high priest had. So you can see that the priest, they had a tunic. They had the sash. And they also had this headdress, which, as you can see, was a little bit different. We can get a better picture of it here. And we're going to deal a little bit with this, with this, um, the uh, Atzitz HaKodesh, or the Nazar HaKodesh, this holy crown. And I have a few other pictures. Let's take a look at something else. Uh, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I think this will give it to us a sense. This is the tunic, right? And we'll discuss, this is the sash. This is the ribbon from which the turban or headdress was made. And these are the michnasayim. These are the pants that both the priest and the high priest wore. So these these particular garments were shared. Let's go back into the into the text. Okay, so here we are. The et hamik hamitz nefet and the headdress sheish made out of linen, the et paare hamik baot sheish, and the decorated turbans made out of linen. And I think the reason why it talks about these two different things is that one of them would have been the way in which the high priest wore it, and the other the regular priest. So this possibly referring to the Kohanim, this possibly referring to the high priest. The et mechnese and the trousers, habad made out of linen again, sheish mushzar, twisted, uh, twisted linen, right? So bad also, I believe, means, yeah, so you can see, I'll just show you the Aramaic. They're two different words, but they both refer to linen. So do you see the Aramaic here? It says butza, and then it says devutz. So the same word, right? He has both the same word. He doesn't have a different word in Aramaic for linen. And shazir means twisted. So just reference, referencing it there. 
ve'et pa'arei ha'migbaot. So it's a little bit, this pa'arei is a little bit different, difficult to translate. The syntax isn't the easiest in the world, right? Uh, Safaria translates it as decorated. <clears throat> I mean, the the splendor, if we, the word tif eret pa'er, uh, glory, splendor of the of the headdresses or the turbans, right? So this Rashi's trying to work through the syntax there, and he says, "Tif eret hamigbaot." Okay, that is the splendor of these turbans, hamigbaot hamefuarot. So here is the one who's he, here's how how Safaria possibly gets its translation, right? That because it says the splendid turbans something like that right of of beauty something like that and again you know headdress is sort of very interesting the symbolism of hats and caps and headdress in general is extremely significant it's almost and perhaps even more significant than other articles of clothing is how headdress conveys uh, issues of uh, status and importance and authority. And, you know, you think, for example, of course, of a, a crown, the idea of it being placed on the head. So there's a, I imagine a, at least a, a doctoral dissertation uh, buried somewhere in that into the significance of, of hats and headdress. So going on, the et ha'avnet and the sash, sheish moshzar, uh, again, um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm thinking, right, uh, yeah, another word, right? Again, look at this. How uh, he, our Oculus is so helpful. Another word. So we've got, so sheish, again, moshzar, of twisted linen. So here, sheish moshzar, see that? Sheish moshzar, udchelet, and blue, for argaman, and purple, the Tolad Shani and uh, crimson yarns. Now Shani is uh, possibly um, possibly silk uh, because sorry Tolat. This word Tolat because the word Tolat means a worm, and so we've discussed this before that possibly this is referring to silk. Maasero came the work of a ro ro embroiderer, or it could possibly mean embroidery work. Just as the Lord had, oh Hashem, had commanded Moses. So again, why are these, this phrase, right? This phrase, kasher tziva Hashem et Moshe, right? To show the continuity of, of this expression of the fabrication of everything that was done, that there's this seamless uh, transition starting from the divine uh, inspiration or, or um, uh, with, uh, with uh, Moses receiving this divine word and then conveying it and then, of course, it actually being enacted. So that whole continuity and presence of the divine. So going on, for Yaasu et sits nazer, and they made the the frontlet, nazer hakodesh, the holy crown we can try and translate it as, right? We saw that Zahav Tahor of pure gold, Vayikhtavu Alav Mikhtav, and they wrote on it Mikhtav pituchei chotem, script that was the impression that of a of a seal, kodesh lashem. This is what they wrote on it, kodesh lashem. And let's take a look and see if we can. Here we go. So we'll get a better picture of it. But there's the kodesh lashem, right? But of course, he doesn't write out ladonai. But this is what he's referring to right here. And we'll take another look at it. Let's see here. If we have one. Let's see it here. There we go. There's another picture of it. 
And just take note, though, how it was attached to the head of the priest, of the high priest. Right. Okay. So let's go back into this. <clears throat> Okay, and by the way, did you see, uh, let me just show you one more time quickly, okay, um, right, how it's, the how he's done this as a, like a signet ring, right? You see how the, the, um, <clears throat> the writing is sticking out like that. I don't know if we'd call it embossed. I don't know if that's the expression we'd use for it. Okay. Let's take a look. There's a very long Rashi on this. Let's see if this is on it right now. Okay, we've got one more verse before we have to get in the Rashi. And they should place upon it a thread of, or a ribbon of blue, to place on the turban, or the headdress, milamala, above, just as God had commanded Moses. And we'll take another look here now. Okay. So this is what we're talking about. So you can see how this ribbon went over the over the headdress as well. And we'll take another look and see how it was tied in beh on behind. Let's see another angle of it. All right. And this. That's how it was tied in behind. So you can see how there were actually four ribbons totally. And then it all got tied back. You'll see Rashi says this actually, according to tradition, was tied, I believe, at Orif, which would be the nape of the neck. And that's not the way it's done here. But it's possible that uh, I'm not understanding perfectly where this went, or it's just for the sake of the model that he's got. So there's some issues here that Rashi needs to address in this in this comment here. So, latet al hamitznefet milamala to place on the headdress above, but al yedei ha ptilim, and it was by means of these ptilim, these ribbons, haya moshivin al hamitznefet, they would place these on the headdress, you saw the picture, kemin keter, as a sort of crown. The if shalomar, but, and one cannot say, because this is ambiguous, but one cannot argue, that the, that, that uh, plate itself, that seats, was on the headdress itself. Sha'arei b'shchitat kodshim, he says that in this tractate, shchitat uh, this is the chapter in a tracta, tractate, Shchitat uh, the the slaughter of sanctified animals. Shaninu, we learned, Sa'aro Haya Nir E, that the hair of the high priest was visible, Bain Sitz Lemitznefet, between this frontlet and the turban. Because on this space is where he would place his tefillin. The priest also had to participate that. Let's see if we can see from here. So this is where he put his tefillin, right? It's there, that his hair was visible. This is, I think, the point that Rashi is trying to make here. And that he places tefillin right there. And the the frontlet was placed on the forehead. So that's where it was, below the tefillin, the head, the head box of the tefillin. And so consequently, the turban or the headdress was above. And here we have the, uh, the little crown or the frontlet below so then what does it mean to say that it was on the headdress above? How do we understand that phrase? But 
Hikshaiti Ba. And uh, he says, I also have another issue, another difficulty. Khan here. Khan, sorry, Ba. Khan hu omer vayitnu alav til tchelet. Here it says, they shall place upon it a thread of blue. Uva inyan hatzva'a. But when Moses is commanded regarding this tzitz, back in Parshat, I imagine it's in Titzaveh, okay? Unless it's in, yeah, I think that's where it would be. Hu Omer, it says, and he says, back chapter, Exodus chapter 28, you shall place it on the thread of blue. So I imagine this is, uh, we're talking about the commandment uh, regarding the tzitz, right? So there it says, you shall Put upon it, a th- a, put the seats upon the ribbon, th- the thread of blue. But Omer ani. So the way I understand it, this is Rashi speaking for himself now. Tilt zeh. This tilt chelat they're talking about. This blue thread that they're talking about. Kutin hein. We're referring to threads. The kashro bahen to tie, attach with through those threads. Ba nefet in the in the crown, in other words, over the crown, the fisha had seats a no ella because the frontlet a no ella me ozen la ozen because in fact the seats only went from one ear to the other ear. Let's take another look here. Okay, so here we go, assuming his ears are here, and this is how the seats went on his forehead from one ear to the next. Okay. <clears throat> and so what could you attach it with? What could you attach? The seats, the mitzvah, on his forehead. And so they're attached to the seats. These threads of blue. To its two ends. And in its middle. And again, just to refresh your memory, right? We can see here, right? So on either end of this, and then in the middle as well. It's exactly what Rashi is saying. Okay. Shebahen uh, koshro, <clears throat> and through them you attached it, you tied it. The tolehu bamitznefet, and you can then hang it. You can suspend that sits. Uh, on the on the mitznefet on the turban, keshehu berosho when it was on his head, ushnei chutin hayu bechol kiatze bekatze, and there were two threads that were on every edge on every end where it came, achat mi maal and one above, vachat mi tachat and one below the tzad mitzcho next to right next to it, uh, his forehead. Okay, so let's take a look carefully. I'll do a little bit more and then we can take a look. The chen be'emtsa'o, and the same in the middle. Okay, let's take a look here. There. Do you see how they were two? So they threaded through. This is the point he's making. So this is actually doubled. There's the one on the outside, and you can't see it, but inside there's another one going back. Here you can see it a lot more clearly. Right, how there was one on the outside, it went through an aperture here, and then on the back, on the inside there, the inside here, and of course on the other side as well. It did exactly the same thing, and that's what Rashi is describing now. Uh, let's see, make sure. Shekach uh, hu Noach, because this would be easy then, Likshor in order to uh, tie. Yes, David. Yeah, just really quick. Those are hooks then, right? The thread's going into some sort of aperture hook, right? Exactly, it's, right. A little, okay. yes. Um, it's. I'm trying to think of what you might call it. I'm sure there's a, a, a name that you give these kinds of things. Like if you think of an eye, I guess that's what they called, you yeah. know, hooks and eyes, and I, right? Yeah. So this yeah. would be a little eye that you put on either end of the seats, and then this eye in the middle of the seats, in the middle at the top of it, right? Got it. Where you you 
Yeah. The ein derch kshira, and you cannot tie anything, but pachot mishne chutin, with less than two threads. Try and tie something with only one thread. If you've ever had a shoelace break, you'll know the frustration. Lachach ne'emar, and for this reason, ne'emar al patil trelet, for that reason it says, on the thread of blue, for alav patil trelet, and for that reason, in other words, with regard to this, uh, this tzitz, right? It says on the blue thread, and it also says for a love p'til uh, or sorry, it's, uh, yes, and then it says and on it a thread of blue. The kosher rashehem hashnayim kulam yachad, and he ties all these sets of two threads together me'achorav behind him the mul or por opposite the nape of his neck. Right, u moshivo al hamitznefet, and then he places it on the turban. So, with the pictures, of course, we can see clearly what's going on here. Right, so there we see how it's over there. Give me one moment, and I have a picture of uh, how it looked in the back. There we have it. So now you can see how all of these were tied on the back and then placed like this crown over his... So this is like a big crown, the whole thing. Okay. How carefully Rashi has to describe this, right? Okay. <clears throat> so going on. For Al-Titma, and then another issue, he says, don't be surprised. Now he's talking about the grammar of the sentence. He says... Don't be surprised that the that the verse doesn't say ribbons of blue or threads of blue. It just says ptiltrelet, a thread of blue. For il umeru and that it, and and be don't be surprised that despite the fact that there are many of them, it only talks about one. It uses the singular. Because we have other examples where the singular is used in regards to, for example, the breastplate, the ephod, and likewise the ephod. It says, the yarkasu et hachoshen. In other words, something like they attached the the breastplate, etc. Okay, and it must it must have. You'll see, for al korchacha. Right. Okay. So since it says they attached the breastplate, right? The breastplate was that square plate that went in front with the stones. The al korchacha, and you have to say you have it perforce pachot mishnaim lo. You can't have any less than two ways to attach the breastplate. It wasn't hanging by one thread. It had to or one chain. It had to hang by two. Uh, uh, okay, so it says because on both on the two edges of the breastplate, there were two rings. Okay, so there were two rings of the breastplate, and then on his two shoulders, right? Of the afford, remember the if you can visualize it, the afford had shoulder straps that went up over his shoulders. I think I can actually show you what we're talking about. Here, these are actually coming from behind. Again, I can show you how it did that. Here, are the shoulder straps. Do you see that? Right. That's what he's talking about right now. And they came up over his shoulders. And this is what he's talking about. There were rings here. We read about these, actually. Just read about them. And how they were attached then to the shoulder straps. So the point is, right now, we haven't gotten... Rashi hasn't made his final point, but we're getting there. Okay. Hayushtei tabaot hayavot. Right? So there were two t uh, uh, t uh, uh, rings on the ephod. Shekenegdang, which were opposite them. And again, by means of tying, they were a total of four of these gold threads. They were. 
ומכל מקום, and nevertheless, פחות משניים אי אפשר, and likewise, it would be impossible to have less than two, and I'm going to show you the wind uh, again carefully, what this, so you see how they were two and two. And likewise, there too, you can just see, if I can make it a little bigger, you can see how there's two here. They were doubled. And I think that's what Rashi is trying to tell us. Give me one second. Okay. All right. And uh, we will stop here today. We will not meet tomorrow. Okay. But we will meet again, please God, on Thursday. And I'm going to pop the arrow here. And put this right here. And I'm going to stop the share. Okay. Any comments before I stop the recording? Okay. I hope that was helpful. I think I could not have done it without the pictures. That's for sure. Okay. How come they say uh, you can't mix uh, linen and wool? Right. So, Harlan, you may recollect we've we've mentioned this before, uh, but I'll be happy to explain it. So they the they actually did mix linen wool in the garments of the high priest. Okay, and because of that. It's it's a way when you don't do it yourself, it's saying this is reserved for royalty. It's a way of showing deep, deep respect in not doing it yourself and treating yourself in that way. So that's one reason why we're not allowed to mix linen and wool. Now there's other there are other discussions about it that try to understand well is it because linen comes from a plant and wool comes from an animal and there's this whole idea of mixing species that's forbidden uh, and possibly if I were to try to scratch that just a teeny little bit it would be that we don't want to play God okay and mix animal life and plant life together. There may have been some idolatrous practices that went along with that. I'm not aware of those specifically. I do know that the fact that the high priest wore garments of linen and wool um, is, is probably significant and had some symbolism. By the way, when it comes to the talit, this talit here, okay, mm -hmm. you can have a a um, a, a, a wool talit and and use uh, silk threads or uh, linen threads, etc., or etc. In the in the case of the talit, it's the only exception where you can actually mix things. But again, remember the talit is something that is a ritual garment. We aren't using it as uh, something to uh, simply wear. Although there is a talit that you wear as a article of clothing, you might say. But again, there's a dedicated, sort of a dedicated way in which this is done. So thank you for raising it really, Harlan. I appreciate your raising it again because it is actually a deep subject. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.